Awesome, I think we're live. Hi everyone, welcome to Rev Bytes with your host, Doug Truitt, Head of Revenue Success at Reynolds United. Hey guys. And myself, John DeRolay, Revenue Management Expert at Wheelhouse, where we'll be having 20 to 30 minute conversations about revenue and distribution topics in the vacation rental and STR spaces. Uh, this is our second episode, and today we're gonna be talking about advertising EKG, how distribution health affects revenue. And before we get started, uh, our last episode was on uh, all the acronyms and kind of KPIs. So we wanted to start out every episode with a little joke KPI. This week's joke KPI is charge max. Charge max quantifies the gross number of times your CEO or controller has asked, why do we even accept American Express when reviewing chargeback data? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, keep an eye out for that KPI yeah. entering the space. It could be really interesting for everyone's internal teams. And let's get started. So how are you doing today, Doug? I'm good, man. I love that. I love that one. Next episode, I'll come up with a, a KPI. <laughs> I think we'll have some good ones. Yeah, um, we will. So let's just start out uh, kind of right at the beginning here. Um, I've heard you mention distribution health a lot, Doug. And uh, what what is it? What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, I've, I've probably heard me say it on the last episode too, but, you know, I say it a lot. It's kind of like one of my things where I feel like I'm a broken record, but, you know, I've always said the thing, like, it doesn't matter whether you set your rates at a hundred bucks or 500 bucks, if it's not visible somewhere and you can't, you can't purchase it, it doesn't matter. Um, so the, the reality is, from a distribution health standpoint, when I mean health, it means like, yeah, you could say that you're live and bookable somewhere, but do you know that with 100% certainty that you are live and bookable? Um, do you know if you are accidentally somebody hit something and the toilet is the main photo instead of actually the beautiful, you know, living space or the beachfront property or the awesome building location or wherever it's at? Um, do you have flexible, non-flexible rate plans built into there? Are they feeding appropriately in, in the right way? Do you have minimum advanced purchase restrictions? Um, is your listing titles kind of consecutive through different distribution channels or how you're portraying what, what it is that you're saying? Are you adapting things? So it's really distribution health really is like, are you putting the best foot forward to showcase all that hard work and effort that revenue managers have done to build rate plans and build things to try and get the right price at the right time for the right customer. And I've kind of modified that from a distribution perspective and said on the right channel too, because there's, there's audiences on each channel that slightly differ from channel to channel. And it's kind of like, you should try to adapt your product to meet the needs of those uh, individual people there. So that's, that's kind of what I mean by distribution health. I'm even working on a project internally right now uh, at Reynolds United to try and identify some like health cards, right? To be able to showcase people like common things, like are you showcasing all the right amenities that convert the highest on certain channels and things like that? So that's kind of what I mean by distribution health. Yeah, that's awesome. I remember, um, you know, going back to the first thing you said is like, it doesn't matter what your rate is if you're not purchasable. You know, our experience at Stay Alfred, we had a a couple situations. I remember Jordan, uh, the CEO oh, of Stay Alfred had a story where, they had no bookings in January in Seattle and they were messing with the rates. And after Seattle ended, they realized that the, the calendars were blocked. And then we had multiple situations, um, which really caused us to, to change what we were doing in the, in the, on the distribution. I mean, really it, we created the whole distribution department around it where uh, we had channels that had either technical outages or integration breaks that, basically shut us down. I remember it happened with VRBO uh, yeah. there and, and Flipkey. Flipkey got bought, they killed their channel. Oh, it God. took, it just cut a huge swathe out of our, um, out of our uh, revenue. We had another situation where VRBO's integration with, I think it was Kigo at the time, it just broke. And yep. uh, it took them two weeks to fix it. And at the time, VRBO was 80% of our distribution mix. So it like crashed our revenue pace and ended up affecting us for, for months after because in order to make bookings through the channels that we had that were less developed, um, we had to really adjust rates. And so even though that it, it took two weeks and really affected us for two weeks, the, the ramifications lasted for months uh, yeah. in terms of our bottom line. And so when you're thinking about these things, you know, you mentioned a couple like, you know, one of them is like, does your stuff work? 
then you're talking about like, is it optimized? Like where, where do we start? Like, how did you get started when you kind of started to look at these things to, to make sure, you know, just where does people start? There's a lot there. Yeah, I think, you know, well, two parts, one, before I get to that, I wanted to comment one thing on what you said too, which is like, you know, when, when a channel goes down or, um, something happens, a lot of times you're not necessarily, you know, depending on what kind of radar nets or so to speak you have open, you may not notice those outages for a delayed time frame until you start seeing like velocity of bookings go down or you look at your daily pickup or something. You're like, wow, this seems weird. It's going down. It's going down. And then all of a sudden you do remember what we had to say off of the code blues and it was like code blue and everybody's like checking listings and checking whatever, everything else. And all of a sudden it was like, you know, you'd see one listing down, two listings down. It was like, well, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, then sure enough, like it's a duck. Um, and so like, I guess the part of that that I want to comment on is that it's not just about, okay, well, yeah, I lost bookings for a week or so. It's like, no, like it's stay Alfred. And in a lot of short term rental companies, they do ask for some deposits up front. And so that's cash flow. I mean, so your cash flow gets impacted that way. And then also you miss out on the high demand of that time frame that people were booking for certain arrival dates in the future. So it's like it kind of double whammies you a little bit because you're trying to make up for lost ground of bookings for those those demand windows that maybe you had to drop your ERs now to try and get more occupancy or whatever. Um, but I think on the the part like where I got started on figuring out like, you know, optimization and understanding what to do is... I think the biggest thing for me was I, I just kind of put myself in the shoes of the customer. I tried to take away all my biases of being from the hotel space, you know, and then, you know, in the short term space and just being in the industry and tried to say, OK, I'm going to take my family somewhere. What am I going to do? What is important to me? What does it look like? And then I let those thoughts kind of then challenge my assumptions to go and talk to our channel reps, right? Um, and, you know, talk to booking.com, talk to Expedia, talk to Airbnb and Verbo and say, hey, I have a thought about this. How does this work? Can you give me some insights? Can you give me some data that says X amount of people convert using this type of photo or this type of layout or this title or this description or these types of amenities? Like doing the homework to find out what it is that each of those channels audiences want to see and want to do and then let that shape how you decide what you do. I mean, there's other, you know, more detailed components to like the optimization that kind of goes in the form of like, do I have the ability to do multi-unit logic, which is more like a hotel style distribution where I have multiple apartments or properties that are very similar and the same that I could put on one listing instead of multiple listings. Um, do I start looking at my reviews? Do I start looking at um, lots of other components that are there? So I think that's that's where I always tend to go as I try to really put myself in the shoes of the customer and say, what are they looking for? What do they want? And I think that's relevant now because there's been a change for sure. Um, I, I'm going to pull two pieces out and then I, I think there's a topic that you're leading into that's going to be really big. But sure. if there's a major takeaway for, for this that I think that people want that's actionable, it's... Um, if you suspect anything, look at your listings on both the back end and the front end. Yes. Train everyone in your organization, reservation agents, customer service agents, revenue managers, distribution people, marketing people, always check both the front end and the back end. The amount of times that we've encountered where something looked like it was working on the back end, but nobody checked the front end and the front end was broken is countless. And that, yep. you know, if you just have a hunch and you train people to always check the front end, you'll start to catch these things and be able to communicate with your reps really clearly about what's going on. Yep. Um, the next kind of thing I think we can shift into is you had mentioned like one, you know, people should be on multiple channels. I talked to a lot of customers, particularly with the, the Airbnb entrepreneurs that have entered the space. It's really a great thing. Uh, but a lot of them are really, you know, channel loyalists. And, um, you know, why should people be on multiple channels? And then uh, after we talk about that, let's talk about like, what does it mean to optimize for different channels? Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, and I'd love to hear your feedback too on it, John, but um, my opinion on, on, you know, people being on more channels is, you know, think about, think about the channels is in two fronts. One, you know, the channels are an extension of your marketing strategy, right? Uh, the channels aren't trying to eat your money. They're not trying to steal your money or do anything from it. They're simply leveraging the fact that they have more 
Google AdWords spend or marketing spend to put your products in front of more eyeballs to get you more bookings. It's your responsibility to try to generate more loyalty and post post booking, you know, processing that that hopefully gets people to become a lifetime value, you know, kind of type of metric or customer that keep coming back to you kind of thing. Um, so I, I think that people really got to think of it. The channels is like a marketing arm and it's an extension of your marketing arm that's cheaper than what you could actually do to go get that those kinds of impressions. And so, you know, being on multiple channels, when you think about it, if you put all of your eggs in one basket, you're counting on that basket and no other basket to, to generate the, the, the support and foundational layer for your business. So, for example, I mean, uh, you referenced in one of those those we were you were just saying about Verbo, you know, at, at one point stay offer it had, you know, 80 percent of its revenue was coming from Verbo. Well, when that channel goes down, 80 percent of our eggs are in that basket. So then we're relying on the 20 percent of the other revenue to to pick up that slack. And that's just simply not going to happen because it's not like any one channel has such a big leverage over the other ones that, you know, can pick up the slack for something else. It's just not, not the way it works and not in an immediate standpoint. So um, my, my philosophy when running distribution at Stay Alfred was that we tried to keep as much evenly, you know, across different channels. Yes. You know, some of the, some of the channels had more buying power, more marketing and, and just converted better, but we tried to throttle those things to understand to keep everything evenly across all different channels. Otherwise, when we have those outages, it was a bigger impact, you know, and, and the outages weren't like, hey, once a month or all the time or whatever. But it was definitely like when it happened, it was it was a big hit. I mean, I remember when we were probably about what, 1500 or 2000 properties deep, there was a significant outage for 48 hours. Our listings were down on on two major channels. And I think it was like 150 or $200,000 haircut basically is what we took on it. And that's, that's big. So, yeah. Well, I think it's interesting to know when you say stuff like that is uh, I totally agree with you. Um, I think what we learned through experience is you, you can't just have one channel um, because if there's a problem or it's not always a problem, sometimes it's not an outage, but for those industry veterans that remember Flipkey, Flipkey was a major channel. It got yeah. acquired and then was destroyed. Yep. Um, or, you know, they just changed their policies, you know, and uh, and you can't spin up a new channel quickly. You have to have it at a baseline. And so, you know, uh, I have a hunch that, you know, a lot of the people who are on Airbnb, I really advise them to get on VRBO and and maybe on a channel manager because I really think that now that Airbnb is public, they're going to, there's no reason why. We, everyone saw today, they brought out a news thing that's saying they're going to look at fees. What that means is they're going to take the fee off the front end and they're going to commission you. Sure. Anyone who's been working with booking.com for a while knows this. And now that they're public, they're going to have a bunch of experienced business people look at that and say, why are we charging more when we could just charge the the guests, they already own the money. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I would expect everyone on Airbnb to see a 10 to 20% commission coming down the pipe. Already the case in Europe. But yep. if you're not, if your PL isn't set up to absorb that cost now, you're going to have a real hard time switching if you haven't already started to develop traction on your other advertisements. So one, mm -hmm. it takes a long time to spin up a channel. And then two, this is where the revenue management side really comes in is because Doug's team at Stay Offered had done such an excellent job of maintaining and developing uh, our advertisements across multiple channels, as we stabilized in revenue, it became the job of the revenue manager to actually shift share to what was most profitable to us. So what we would see is we would have properties that were really high value, and we would distribute different pricing to those products to make sure we maximized our our take home you know rev par a cost par you know after commission mm -hmm. because if you only have a few four bedrooms you know we're going to pump that price up on expedia and booking.com because we're paying a commission but uh because we really want to shift it towards airbnb now it's important to note that we needed all of those channels to be available because if something broke or there was you know book expedia and booking.com particularly were much better at it short-term stays for us because they just have so many more eyes on them you need them all but you can start to optimize th through the price if you have all the channels functional but if you don't have the channels functional it doesn't matter yep 
Exactly. I mean, and the other part of some of those strategies too is like, um, you know, one of the one of the times I think I forget what somebody at Stay Alfred had said it wasn't it wasn't you, John, but somebody had said, well, hey, why don't we why don't we just uh, you know limit the availability that we send to uh, Booking or Expedia, and then just leave it open for you know the direct site and some of these other ones or whatever to try and do it. And I said that's a horrible idea. And I said the reason why is because if you know you you should play with play with the rates in terms of like um, you know offering up like uh, trying to build a flexible rate rate plan that you can do on Booking.com and Expedia, where you may not be able to build multiple rate plans within Airbnb or something, but build multiple rate plans to allow more bookings at a higher rate with more flexibility or whatever, and then keep all of your availability open because at the end of the day, again, the the distribution of your product is really an extension of your marketing efforts to the OTAs meaning using OTAs as an extension of your marketing efforts. And so the more you keep things live and bookable and that are available and are online, the more eyeballs that are seeing your product and that can either book through the OTA or what we do know that people do is they do integrity checks and they go check a direct website. And so the idea is keep that funnel as wide and big as possible to get bookings delivered. But like you said, change up your strategy. If one of your channels are eating too much of your lunch, as I used to say a lot of times, find ways to make, to slow down the conversion process a little bit on some of those channels to let some of the other channels get some of the share. And you can do that via by, you know, a lot of, a lot of channel managers and a lot of um, PMSs and stuff allow for rate markups, you know, we're on certain channels to kind of help offset some commission costs and things like that. You can do it through, you can do it through more uh, rigid minimum length to stay settings. Um, or minimum advance purchase restrictions. I mean, there's lots of tools and levers with a lot of these bigger channels that they can help you to achieve your individual goals, right? And that should be to diversify your your footprint. And I agree with you. I actually think you should always do it through price. Like if you want to deter people from booking on Expedia and booking.com, don't close your inventory. If you close your inventory, you're not going to show up in their search. They don't want to show right. you. Do it through price because you know, you're going to deter bookings if the price is way different, but the banner effect is real, especially yep. on booking.com and Expedia. These are marketing companies. Those people will look for your product. And something that I think we did at Stay Alfred, which I think was a great idea, you know, from your team and our marketing team and everyone should do, especially in our space where you have a lot of individual listings is have something branded in the apartment, pillow, poster, photo of your rules, and make sure those pictures are in your listings. Yep. Because people pay attention. They're looking through these photos. They'll see your branded stuff, especially if it's in two or three pictures. And they'll look you up. Yeah. And they'll book. They may not book through you direct the first time because they haven't used you. They may still go through the larger channel because there's there's some protection there. But yeah. if they have a great experience, they're aware of your brand and they'll use you. And people do look up your website if they see that. And you can't always post your your brand, or sometimes it's just not always clear. You know, if you scroll right. to the bottom of a booking.com thing, it's like at the bottom, put it in your photos. Yep. Well, I mean, there's, and there, I mean, man, there's, there's so much here. Cause there's, there's two pieces, one, and a very, very serious thought for everybody out there listening to this. One thing I want to make sure everybody knows is if you do or have been playing with availability to any one of the channels where you kind of limit the availability, cause you're trying to do something, you need to change that behavior very quickly because channels like booking.com and Expedia and other ones actually monitor how much availability you're sending to them. And they choose how you end up in search rank results based mm -hmm. on how open you are and what you're doing flexibility wise. Some of the things they consider are like cancellations too. If you do a lot of host initiated cancellations, they can penalize you in the search rank results. And I mean, those are some serious things you got to consider with re regards to that banner or the billboard effect, trying to get as much eyeballs on your product as possible. Showcase as much as you can. You're a partner with those channels and you should be, but you should be doing it in the way that uses their, I mean, they have plenty of tools to allow you to do all these things you wanna do. Um, and then as far as the branding aspect, I mean, you know, I think Verbo, um, you know, and a couple of other ones learned learned a little bit early on when they wanted to try and suppress as much branding as possible. They were like, you know, suppressing branding names from listing titles and description contents and things like that. And I think they they reverted that a little bit because they realized that, you know, branding in some aspect in a very healthy way 
became a, a, an integrity place for people to buy. I mean, you know, if you go to Airbnb, I know people are used to seeing like the host profile pick is a person who owns the place or whatever. But if you're a professional company, it looks a lot better if you can make that profile pick the actual like logo of your company because it boosts confidence from the buyer to say, oh, this is a professionally managed company. It's not just a person. Now, I don't want to degrade the fact of showing a person or something to add the human element, but I can say that from the standpoint of adding a logo or a photo of a logo or something to that effect or the name of the company in the title of the listing helps buyers to understand, okay, these guys do this for a living. They're not doing it for just you know, sharing a property, a vacation home that they have every once in a while or something like that. They actually know it. And then they can go integrity check because it's not just about checking if it's, a, if it's, you know, available on a direct site or somewhere, it's actually checking like, hey, are there review aspects for this company or this property somewhere else that I can look at to help my decision on purchasing something? So um, the one thing too also is don't put phone numbers, don't put like contact us now, buy now, don't do any of that stuff in your OTAs because they frown on that too. And they'll shut your account down if you do those kinds of things. Um, I think uh, Airbnb even has a very advanced AI that looks at your photos. And if you put like phone numbers in the photos, they'll actually suppress those photos and, and slap you on the wrist, kind of suspend your listing for a few days. So um, be aware of that. They're, the OTAs are super smart. They're probably the best in the, in the, in the business with regards to marketing. So but they have tools and supplies to make you successful and you should really, really utilize all those. I've talked to a number of uh, traditional vacation rental companies where, you know, it doesn't make as much sense to use the hotel OTAs. Um, but one thing that I've suggested to people is, you know, it's a lot of work to optimize all these listings. And, and if, since they're paying and they can make their money somewhere else, maybe it's not worth it. But what they should do is choose some listings and really try to optimize them on booking.com and Expedia, particularly for that billboard effect. Because yeah. you know you don't need your whole portfolio, you just need some branded, really high quality listings that will show up to people. And booking.com, I know this was something that Stay Alfred did, which was top notch. They have a program called Premium Premium Preferred. Properties, I think, Preferred. Preferred. Yeah. And uh, they pick like, you know, only like 10 or whatever properties in a market, but they reserve a few spaces for vacation rentals. And um, basically what happens is if you have a multi-unit listing, you, you, can, you can get there because it's, it's really quality based. You have to be one available selling and have uh, a high quality product um, based on their reviews. So if you have a multi-unit listing, it's a lot easier to build that up. But if you get one of your properties into there, the benefit is, is they will always show that listing even if it's sold out. So your banner effect is massive. And they're not charging. Yeah. They're not making money on that. They're just... They're no. being a partner because they want to be a trusted source as well. Yeah. And so if you have like in your portfolio, some condos or uh, any multi-unit listing in the vacation rental space, or just even a really top listing, I would say, you know, if you have the room in the profit margin to develop that listing on booking.com, there's a lot of direct marketing benefits that can come from that. And yeah. I think urban providers, particularly who already use these kind of channels, you know, that's something to keep in mind is, try to get at least one property per market in that preferred program. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, a little more context with that too, like the preferred program on booking.com, I believe they charge you like an extra 3% commission yeah. for bookings you get when you're in that status of preferred, but it always penciled. I mean, we always, we always did the math on it, you know, at, at stay offered and we constantly would review it. Now there were some properties that we got into preferred that we pulled off because it was like, ah, uh, the velocity of bookings is, this property's getting wasn't wasn't totally there but i mean one property we had which was like the crown jewel and i know it was kind of a, a unicorn but i mean 505 in in nashville um it it was on page one against in downtown nashville it was on page one against like grand old opry like all these huge huge hotels it was it was on page one in those guys and and uh you know dovetailing with that that thought about it, I mean, the preferred you get, you basically, you know, on some instances, I think we saw analysis where we put a property on preferred and it went from page four to page one in a lot of aspects when we did that to certain listings. And that had a huge effect on conversion rate and velocity of, of bookings and things that happen. And so the question I got for you, John, on that one is, you know, can doing stuff like that or being on more distribution channels, like how does that, how does that affect 
the revenue management strategy you have? I mean, is that something that you decide and say, okay, wow, the velocity keeps going up, so I'm going to raise the rates. I'm going to change my my floor. Like, what do you what do you do with something like that when you start to get more velocity? Does it change your philosophy? Um, it. I mean it's going to affect the things that control revenue management. So when you're operating, like there's two ways you have traditional VR and, and kind of like multi-unit or uh, a lot of urban condo in urban and condo, you're looking at pickup. So the more people who are purchasing, the higher you're going to be able to push your rates. And when you have that pool available, you're just able to react much faster because you have so much more opportunity for booking signal, you know, so you're seeing bookings, you're able to push the rate. You can, always feel a little bit more secure pushing the rate a little bit more aggressively because you know you you have the widest possible net if you're a traditional vacation rental manager i would say because those listings tend to be binary um you just start out a little higher you know like you know that you want to be positioned at the top of the market especially in the prime booking window 30 or 60 or 90 days out depending on your product um because you're not just going to have the million people on Airbnb. You're also going to have the 10 million people on booking.com. And you're also going to have the 10 million people on Expedia. And the kind of thing is, is like, that's like fishing. Mm -hmm. You don't, you can afford to hold out for the biggest fish for longer because there's always, you know, you're fishing in a pond with more fish. And, um, the other thing too you can do is when you have those channels that maybe have high commissions is you can throw some Hail Marys out. Like maybe, you know, you know, VRBO and Airbnb are your main, you're going to price those pretty where you're comfortable, but you're more than, it's more than easy to just put out like a 20 or 30 or 40% higher rate on the hotel channels, because now all you need to do is capture that one guy who's going to buy it, <laughs> you know, yeah. and if he buys it, now you're making more than you would have not necessarily repeatable, but if you're not really focusing on those channels anyway, there's only upside to gain. Yeah. Cool. No, I, I, I agree. I think, I, I think it's interesting. The, the dynamic, um, you know, I think going back to like the stay offer days, like, you know, when you, you were running, you were running the sales team. Right. And I was, uh, I was doing revenue management and that's when kind of, you know, Jordan, the CEO and, and a few of us started realizing that, you know, I think it was when, you know, no offense to the Kigo folks out there, but um, when Kigo started having some issues because we got so big, you know, there was, it was, it was tough for the system to keep up that we started thinking about, okay, let's, you know, let's get a different PMS. Let's do this because we're getting bigger. And then all of a sudden distribution came into play about, you know, about the, the actual should be giving, be giving time and attention to it. Right. I mean, it distribution came out of, something where it was like the aha moment that we realized like our revenue management game could be the best in the world, but it doesn't matter if it's not there. So, I mean, another question maybe out there for us to talk about would be like, should, should companies uh, invest into like distribution management? Should they invest into separate entities or should they split off like a revenue management person they have into a hybrid role where they focus on distribution? Like I'd love to hear your take, take on that or what you think. Totally. I mean, it really depends on the size of the company. When I advise people that I'm talking to through Wheelhouse or when I was a consultant, usually my advice was that your revenue manager should understand your distribution completely. And so there's a lot of crossover. Not everyone needs a full-time revenue manager, but they probably need a full-time, they need a part-time revenue manager, a part-time distribution person, and a part-time marketing person. And so those skills all overlap because you have to understand the ecosystem that you're working in. Yeah. Um, in order for those to get siloed, you have to be really big, right? And so for a lot of growing companies, I would say that there's a lot of crossover between revenue management distribution and marketing, particularly, on, I mean, so much of early marketing is OTA distribution advertising, yeah. that uh, if you don't have the resources to maybe support a whole person, then that is something that's really going to come into play, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, good a good caveat or example to that is, remember, um, you know, at Stay Offered, like we were so fast growing, right? So whether, whether we were a small company or a big company, the thing that any company should think about while they're growing is like, we, we got to a place where it was like, we need to get listings live and bookable like yesterday. Like it needed to be as fast as possible. But in order for that to happen, you also have to have rate plans built out. So you have, so there's this like dynamic and flow that we got down pretty good at one point 
where you had to have like revenue management was working stuff that the business development team or the acquisition team or whoever was getting new inventory, the revenue management team was like kind of working with them going, okay, here's some assumptions, here's some thoughts, here's what we're going to do. And then it was like, boom, as soon as like ink was dry on, on deals of saying, Hey, we're going to do this or whatever. It was like, boom, distribution, go marketing, go. And it was like, this kind of nice, it felt like chaos at the time, but looking back, it was a very oiled machine of like, this happens here, this happens here, this happens there. And I mean, pridefully say we, we as a team had gotten listings live and bookable from the time ink was, was dry on a deal in like seven or eight days. I mean, it was, it was impressive to see that we could actually get bookings within seven or eight days of signing deals and making things move forward. And I think that's, that's something that a lot of companies should strive to do, whether they're small or big, is try to develop SOPs, processes, and best foot forward practices to get your stuff going as fast as possible and efficient as possible. And I think it's important for people to remember that, you know, by the time Stay Offered was a well-oiled machine, we yeah. were doing all these things simultaneously because we understood the process. But the way it started out is we just had a marketing team. Mm -hmm. And the marketing team was responsible for making sure the rights were in the system, for building the rates, building the advertisements. Then we had a marketing and a, and a revenue management team. And the revenue management team did the research for the rates, and they adjusted the rates ongoing. And the marketing team did all the advertising. Then we had a revenue management team, a marketing team, and a distribution team. And we started to carve out those functions as we got bigger. But when you're in a smaller place, you build off of what you have because there is so much cross-functionality and you don't necessarily have the resources to allocate to each individual thing separately. Yeah. Well, I think, I think you know, the resources that are out there for smaller companies that maybe can't get to a place where like we were at Stay Offered with, a, you know, big teams and siloed teams and things like that is that you know, there's resources like Wheelhouse. I mean, Wheelhouse can can do your pricing, can do your rate management, help you identify things and do a lot of the, the heavy lifting legwork. And then stuff like Reynolds United, I know this sounds like a little bit of a plug, but Reynolds United can help you with getting your distribution and getting things out and, and created faster through just having connections to your PMS or wherever you're at that builds in your content and everything else. So, I mean, they're technology in this space is getting so much better from when we were doing it, you know, when we were smaller. And so I think there's more resources to help people perfect and speed up things with efficiency um, by, by utilizing those things. So. Absolutely. And we're pretty much getting on time, but I do want to bring up one thing because yeah. I agree, like the technology today can cover a lot of these functions and gives you now the opportunity to just have one person be able to monitor and optimize these things instead of constantly having to build everything from scratch. Yeah. But, um, you know, you bring up a really good point, which you mentioned early on, you're working on building out distribution health cards mm -hmm. through Reynolds United. I'm really fascinated. Can you give us a minute or two on that? And then we'll kind of wrap it up. Yeah. So the, the idea on these, these health cards, and this is, you know, strictly just conceptual at this point, and we're, we're going to try and do it, but you know, Revenue success in my role with Reynolds United is really to try and help our clients gain back more transparency and visibility into how their performance and what they're doing um, to then help them do better, right? I mean, again, going back to saying, if you're connected to something, you should be able to get bookings doesn't always mean that case. I mean, you have to, you have to nurture all those other pieces. So these health cards are going to look at things like, what's your first photo? What's the main photo that's showing up on your, on each of your properties? Um, how many, how many people, you know, what's the maximum number of guests that can actually stay in the property based on what's being fed from your, from your PMS to the channels or wherever it's going? Um, how many photos do you have? What's the count of photos? Um, how many days has it been since you got a booking on this property? Um, what are the rate markups that you're utilizing on certain channels or certain things? What's the RevPAR contribution maybe or the occupancy contribution that some of these channels are giving you and what should you be considering there? Um, what kind of amenities are you doing? And we're going to try and work with some of the channels to find out what are the top converting amenities that everybody should have and then build a list on that. Um, so the, the goal for these health cards that we want to do is basically be able to help our clients, whether you have 50 properties or you have 10,000 properties, be able to have a report that gives you at any given time tied to the database that says, here's all of your properties that are missing some of the things that we define as will make you, you know, successful from a conversion standpoint or putting your best foot forward so that they can have something that kind of finds the needle in the haystack to go work on. Cause as we said earlier, you know, having the whole entire company go do a code blue and go look at everything 
could be a waste of a lot of time to find one small nugget that maybe, okay, we got to fix this or do that. But if, you know, Reynolds United could help clients find that with a report rather than trying to go search blanketly across stuff, it might save them time. So that's, that's kind of what we're conceptualizing in our goal is right now to try and do for our clients. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for this, but are you going to be including review stuff in that? Yeah, we'd like to. I mean, some of the channels uh, have review APIs that we can pull stuff in, um, but but not all of them. So we'd like to, to to pull the ones that we can and surface that because review component, we could probably do another. We should probably do an episode on reviews because uh, that that touches a lot of areas. But um, I think reviews plays a huge piece in distribution health as well. Awesome. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Let's uh, yeah. tell us a little bit about your product. I'll tell them a little bit about Wheelhouse and then we'll sign off until next time. Sure. Yeah. So uh, Reynolds United is a connectivity channel manager um, by trade, um, but we're adding other components. Uh, we have a product live right now called Data Studio for all of our connected clients, um, basically giving them um, access to see their performance, their pickup, their data. Um, and then there's additional services or products on top of that that deliver them uh, market level data or even just more robust things like cancellation details and booking window analysis of their data as they're connected to us with channels. And so, again, our goal is to, to from a revenue success standpoint, Reynolds Area is help clients get more transparency about their business and just to, to help them, you know, be on the best foot and uh, doesn't cost them really much anything extra. We're a SaaS model business. So, yeah, that's me and us. Awesome. Great product. Uh, a lot of experience working with them. And uh, for those who don't know, I'm with Wheelhouse. Uh, Wheelhouse is a dynamic pricing engine. Um, we not we have the best algorithm, I think. Uh, there's a lot of great folks to talk to in the space, but you'll find that we really have uh, made an algorithm that recommends rates specific to your listing for every single day in the future. And every day we're ingesting tons of market data uh, to react as well. We're the most reactive in terms of what's going on. We just signed an awesome... Uh, partnership with key data. A lot of people recognize that. So that's going to supplement and power our engine as well. And we've really focused on building a UI that makes it intuitive and easy to do your revenue management. So whether you're the kind of person who wants to set it and forget it, you can trust our algorithm or you're someone who really wants to spend the time to maximize and optimize their revenue. We give you the tools to do so easily. So uh, we'd love to have you as a partner. Uh, for pricing and and please reach out to uh to me or to wheel uh use wheelhouse.com and uh, we'd love to start a conversation yeah and lastly too just to add in there that wheelhouse is an integrated partner to reynolds united so if there's any reynolds united clients out there that are interested in having some some reactive modeling dynamic yielding type stuff uh embedded you can definitely do that through your integration you're already connected to reynolds united by adding wheelhouse into it so reach out to one of your reynolds united reps or myself and we can help you there too Awesome. Well, thanks for everyone's time today. I hope you guys found it valuable. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to doing this again with you in a couple of weeks, Doug. Hell yeah. Awesome. All right. Have a good one. Bye, everyone. See you guys. Thanks.